Alex Bennett was born in Christchurch, New Zealand in 1970. He spent a year in Japan as part of a high school exchange program where he first experienced kendo, leading to a lifetime of dedication to this art. Returning to Japan for graduate work, he received a PhD in Human and Environmental Studies from Kyoto University in 2001. He subsequently received a PhD in Japanese Philosophy from the University of Canterbury in 2012. He has worked at the International Research Center for Japanese Studies and the Department of Japanese Studies at Tokyo University and is currently a professor in the Division of International Affairs at Kansai University. Alex is also a prolific writer on Japanese history and culture in both English and Japanese. Over the past few years, his books have fundamentally changed the way people look at Japanese martial arts. He also founded and serves as editor-in-chief of Kendo World, the world's only English language journal dedicated to Kendo. He is a seventh Dan Kendo Kyoshi and holds high ranks in a number of other Budo. So we gathered here today to celebrate the memory of Don Draeger. Could you tell us a bit about how he's influenced your work and perhaps also your life in Japan? Well, obviously, I don't have a direct relationship with Don Draeger. He's before my time. Um, but uh, like many uh, uh, martial arts enthusiasts around the world, um, the introduction into the theory uh, of uh, traditional Japanese martial arts, modern martial arts, really comes from uh, the blueprint that uh, Don Draeger supplied. Uh, as in, he was able to convey uh, nuances about the culture which Japanese people have a lot of trouble conveying and he really sort of set the tone for later generations of people like myself who have dedicated um, uh, lives to not only practicing but also researching, studying the martial arts. So without the work that Draeger uh, did, um, you know, we would have nothing uh, to sort of build our experiences on. Um, unless, of course, you speak really good Japanese and you live in Japan for a long time, which pretty much counts uh, most people in the world out. So he provided an incredible service, uh, not only to um, non-Japanese uh, martial uh, or budo enthusiasts, but also to Japan um, as well. And that's something that Japanese people don't realize. When dealing with the groundbreaking works of pioneers, it's always easy to pick the holes and inaccuracies or the misunderstandings in their writings. Mm -hmm. How well do you think that the initial writings of Draeger stand today to, of course, the much, much larger amount of knowledge that is available to anyone? Um, of course, uh, but that's, uh, you know, the fact that he was writing uh, his work in the, you know, 60s and 70s. Um, of course, it's going to be dated to a certain extent because, you know, um, Budo research has come a long way uh, in the world, but also in Japan as well. Um, so, of course, there's going to be areas that are dated, uh, but that is not to say um, that the work is still incredibly reliable. It is kind of like uh, still very much, broadly speaking, the basis which everybody um, works from. I mean, if you write an article or a thesis or something, you know, in, in English about uh, something to do with uh, Budo culture. Um, if you don't have Don Draeger referenced, you know, in your bibliography, then nobody takes it seriously because it means you haven't done your work. Um, but interestingly, I think Draeger, uh, what, there's a couple of things which he uh, still stands out and even you know the, the the researchers based in Japan have a lot to learn of him. One is the work that he did in comparative martial culture. Uh, the Japanese researchers of of Budo uh, tend to have a habit of just looking at what they do, and it's very uh, you know they don't like to look outside. They very rarely compare uh, the Japanese Budo Bujutsu experience with uh, similar cultures around the world. Don Draeger did that right from the start and so in that sense he's, he's still a pioneer. Um, the other thing which uh, I think um, is really important uh, which I'll probably talk about a little bit today is he came up with uh, classifications um, of uh, martial 
martial arts and civil martial arts. Uh, in other words, he categorised them as bujutsu and budo, and further categorised them into classical bujutsu, classical budo, modern bujutsu, modern budo. Uh, just to clarify and here, um, the difference between bujutsu and budo is not something that is actually necessarily present in Japanese writings, is it? Yeah, no, that, that, see, this is, this is a really interesting thing. Um, Japan has a real problem with identifying constructs of what uh, the various um, uh, kinds or motivations of, of Budo existed and, and what they've done generally is they've divided it into two. Kobudo, anything that was before Meiji, and Gendai Budo, anything that's after Meiji. And Kobudo is always called Bujutsu or uh, Buge or Kobudo or Koryu. And what Draga identified, you know, um, quite succinctly was that even within the, what is generally referred to as a bujutsu or kobudo, there are many uh, variations of that. And, it, and in the modern era as well, there are also many variations. And he actually categorized those. The problem is he used the word bujutsu and budo, um, which are used in a different way in Japan. And so there's a little bit of confusion there, but he did... Uh, provide some really interesting categorizations which, uh, which are really needed in Japan too, um, to sort of, uh, because of how um, aimai, I'm trying to think of the word in English, what's aimai, uh, ambiguous sort of groupings that they've got, um, there's a lot of contradictions in, in people's understanding and it, often the reality and the history just sort of don't quite match up and Drago, <laughs> he really did a good job at matching that up. So you can pick holes in it because there are always exceptions to the rule, but essentially provided, a, uh, provided the groundwork, which I think now um, has to be um, looked at once again. And uh, the fact that we're holding a, a, symp a symposium of this nature in Japan, uh, and we had another one yesterday with the Japanese Academy of Budo, which is where all the Japanese um, researchers of Budo gather, and uh, it um, interestingly uh, gave them some. Uh, of course, they're going to pick holes in certain things, but it also got them thinking. It's like, wow, gee, we've uh, gone all this time without really cleaning this mess up, and he had already done that. Um, so his his work, I could I would say, is becoming even more pertinent now. Um, many years after his death, and, and that's why we're revisiting it. So, Don Draga and migration of the spirit of Boo, cultural heresy, hearsay, or here to stay. Um, I will be talking about my own experiences more than anything, and I understand that everybody's different, everybody's experiences are different, um, and uh, when I talk about Budo or I talk about Kendo, um, I don't uh, pretend to represent that, just, just my experiences to date. So with that disclaimer out the way, let's have a look at <clears throat> concepts. In fact, uh, uh, previous two speakers, uh, Chip and Liam, have already gone into this. And uh, it's, I think, really, Drager's legacy uh, in terms of his, the, the constructs that he created um, uh, to well, categorize the various uh, kinds of Budo and the motivations and so forth uh, has largely been ignored in Japan. And the more I look at it and the more research I do from completely different angles, the more profound I'm starting to, uh, to see his ideas were. And um, let's just start by the official concept. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, Budo, the martial ways of Japan, have their origins in the traditions of Bushido, the way of the warrior. Budo is a time-honored form of physical culture comprising of Judo, Kendo, Kudo, Sumo, Karate Do, Aikido, Shorinji Kenpo, Naginata, and Ju Kendo. Hmm. Practitioners study the skills uh, while striving to unify mind, technique, and body, develop his or her character, enhance their sense of morality, 
and to cultivate a respectful and courteous demeanor. Practiced steadfastly, uh, these admirable traits become intrinsic to the character of the practitioner. The Buddha arts serve as a path to self-perfection. This elevation of the human spirit will contribute to their social prosperity and harmony and ultimately benefit the people of the world. Okay, so this is officially what Buddha is. Um, this was, uh, well, this philosophy of Buddha was, uh, in Japanese it's called Buddha no Rinen. It was established uh, by the Japanese Buddha Association, Nihon Buddha Kyogikai. Uh, well, it's problemat uh, problematic on many, many different fronts. It serves a purpose, and I'm not here to criticize this, but I think it demonstrates uh, some inherent problems in the way that Buddha was perceived and promoted in Japan, and by virtue of that, everywhere else around the world. Um, for example, uh, <laughs> where do I start? Right, well, let's have a look at these Buddha. First of all, Judo created 1882 by Kanojiro. Okay, great. Uh, kendo, Kudo, Sumo, right. Uh, karate Do, well, it's not really Japanese, is it? Um, Aikido, uh, well, it's pretty much a post war thing, really. Uh, Shorinji Kempo. <laughs> <laughs> Naginata and Ju Kendo, etc. etc. So we we something that doesn't when you know the history, you know that something's not right with this. If you don't know the history, uh, then it's oh really? Naruhodo. Okay, great. Um, so on the surface I think this is fine, but this really represents <laughs> Uh, deeply entrenched conceptual misunderstandings that exist in Japan. Okay, the so-called home of Budo culture. One other thing which is, I think, is really important here, it doesn't even mention at all uh, Kobudo or Koryu. Um, and that, quite simply, is because <laughs> it's treated as completely separate. A completely different thing. But uh, as we've heard from our previous speakers and from my own personal experience training in Koryu and Gendai Budo uh, for around about 30 years, um, I think of them as essentially the same and very complementary as well. Um, I think it's a glaring problem uh, that Kobudo and Budo in Japan are treated essentially as two different things. Let's have a look at uh, Don Drager's uh, constructs, which um, uh, Chip and Liam have already talked about, but it's good to go back because really they're quite remarkable. Um, Chip introduced uh, in his uh, presentation, uh, Drager, this is from a, from a lecture, I believe, is it Chip, right? So martial combative systems, combative systems are those whose primary intended design and function are aimed at application to the military battlefield. And he's divided that into classical bujutsu and modern bujutsu. Now, when we normally think of bujutsu, we think of stuff that was around before the Meiji period. But what Drag is uh, saying here is, well, no, no, there's bujutsu in our period as well. Taiho jutsu, what the police do, for example, you know, that was created in the 20th century. Um, civil combative systems or plebeian um, systems are those whose primary intended design and function are aimed at civilian-based outcomes, matningen kese, okay, becoming a better person uh, through the vehicle of, of budo. And again, he divides these up into classical budo and modern budo. Now, when we think of budo today, uh, we think of gendai budo as in all the stuff that was created from after Kano Jiguro uh, invented his, uh, his um, judo. Um, but classical Budo, uh, again, uh, many, many Ryuha, which we call Koryu now, or Kobudo, were created in the Tokugawa period, which uh, saw no um, military uh, application or experience. And so the purpose of those were really, uh, well, a kind of way of honing the body and polishing the mind and so on and so forth, very similar to the kind of things that we have seen in the very first slide about the concept of Buddha today. Um, so he makes these distinctions, but broadly speaking, Bujutsu first priority combat, 
followed by discipline morals to make yourself combat combat effective budo morals discipline aesthetic form so um, just this is just to simplify everything to bring it all back together to where he was coming from classical bujutsu medieval early modern time battlefield combat soldiery uh, classical budo medieval early modern period civil martial arts modern bujutsu meiji onwards police army etc and modern budo meiji onwards civil the nine Budo that were mentioned uh, in the uh, philosophy of Budo and others that aren't and that's another important point as well. Uh, for example, um, my university in Japan where I work is Kansai University and Kansai University has its own Budo, believe it or not. Uh, you've heard of Ni Nihon Kenpo, right? Nihon Kenpo was actually invented by um, a, a former student at Kansai University. So what makes Shorinji Kenpo more important or representative of a Gendai Budo than Nihon Kenpo. In fact, I believe Saw Doshin even went and studied a little bit of Nihon Kenpo as well. So there's a lot of political wrangling that was going on there as well. So um, I don't want to get into that, but the point is that as uh, well, the, one of the big problems in Japan today, there's so many contradictions that sort of aren't even questioned anymore. Um, <clears throat> but going back, uh, to what Draeger, um, his classifications, I think, I came at it from a completely different perspective, but essentially it all turns out to be the same. Now, I've given everybody a print, uh, which uh, is for your reference, and it's, it's still a work in progress, um, but <clears throat> I sort of plotted uh, the evolution, if you like, uh, of the martial arts or martial culture in Japan and uh, the various trends, social trends, social historical trends and so forth. And I've used a word uh, constantly throughout, reinvention. Now everybody's heard of the concept, I, I, I imagine, uh, that was made famous by Hobsbawm, uh, the invention of tradition. The invention of tradition is, it's, well, it's a little bit, uh, uh, every tradition, of course, it's invented, so what's new about that? But when, when you hear invention of tradition, it's usually in reference to a specific period of time in world history, particularly the 19th century or perhaps the early uh, 20th century, uh, when modern nation states were being created. And in order to uh, formulate a specific distinctive national identity, they would borrow uh, things from the past. And in Japan's case, samurai culture became one of those things that was very useful for uh, creating a, an identity that made the Japanese distinctive in the world stage and so on and so forth but so when we talk about modern oh, sorry the invention of tradition the time period is almost always um, around about here Meiji uh, period not only in Japan but you know everywhere around the world um, but if we look at the uh, the martial culture of Japan we see this constant reinvention actually um, because the, the uh, martial arts had to adapt or had, were, had to be used to suit completely different social situations, even within the same country. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing process. So what I'm trying to get at here, uh, in Japan, uh, now the way that Budo is usually categorized, as I said, it's like a, a dichotomy. Um, Kobudo and modern Budo. Um, obviously, this is not enough because even before the modern period, there's every, every period, every region almost is different. Participation in the martial arts took on different reasons, different meanings uh, throughout history. So to lump it into two like that is very simplistic. simplistic um, to put it nicely. So another one of the problems though with Draeger's constructs, I don't think it's a problem as such, but uh, in Japan it's largely ignored or it is criticized because the way in which he uses the word Budo and Bujutsu is actually a little bit different uh, to the way it is used or understood in Japan. Budo as a word, for example, um, 
now when you hear budo, you think, oh, judo, kendo, karate, etc., etc. But um, for most of the, uh, the word's existence, um, budo actually meant bushido. It actually meant uh, the warrior ethos, not martial arts as such. Um, other problems, which sort of were mentioned very briefly yesterday, um, when you think about uh, bujutsu being martial technique, therefore more combat oriented, and budo being the modern uh, uh, reincarnation, if you like, or reinvention into a, a, into a way for uh, educational purposes. Well, that's broadly speaking, sort of true in Japan, but there was a time in Japanese history, uh, the 1930s in particular, where Budo actually became very combat oriented, or at least it was, it was utilized for that purpose. So there, there's, there's a lot of confusion, even in Japan, with the, how these words are used. There is no real consensus. Um, so it's always been changing, as I've mentioned, so lumping everything into old and new, as it is in Japan at the moment, is very problematic. And it also ignores what Drager was pointing out, that both are or can be civil and both can be martial, actually, as well. Um, another problem <laughs> is this uh, in Japan and, you know, a fairly standard international understanding is budo is actually, in terms of its moral significance, superior to jutsu. Okay, so um, do is more important or uh, more humane, perhaps, than jutsu. Well, jutsu, the word itself, it has many different translations. So you'll hear science, you'll hear technique, you'll hear art, and so forth. But um, again, if we, if we refer to Drager, as he rightly pointed out, even uh, the so-called bujutsu uh, had a very important moral or uh, self-cultivational aspect to it. But this sort of became, it was a very simple, I guess you could call it a marketing ploy. Um, I might get into trouble if I say that. I definitely would not say this in the Nihon Budo Gakkai or anything like that. But <laughs> because it's you guys, I will say it. It was a marketing ploy by... Um, Kano Nike Jigoro. <laughs> Just do it, baby. And the reason why he did that um, was because uh, he wanted to make his style of jujutsu, his ryuha of jujutsu, if you like, something that's distinct. Distinctive from jujutsu as it was commonly known at the time, had a very bad reputation as being something practiced or used by ruffians and so no, 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 what I'm doing is far more profound. It's more about education of the human mind and the body. That's why I'm going to call mine Do um, and Judo. And so there's old Kano Jigoro. And this was, this ball, this Nike ball was picked up by another fellow um, in the mid uh, Taisho period. It's about 1919, I think it was. Nishikubo Hiromichi, and he was actually the mayor of Tokyo at one stage, but he also became vice president of the Dainippon Butokukai, which was kind of like the gatekeeper for uh, this burgeoning new martial traditions that were making the rounds in Japan at the turn of the century. And uh, he was also the, uh, became the, uh, the president or the principal of the Dainippon Butokukai's special school that was established to train teachers who could go out into the community throughout the country and spread uh, Budo. We we're talking about that. Um, so as it stands today with the Kobudo and the Budo dichotomy, what are the differences? How are the uh, approaches different? What, what is the, the kind of the flavor of them? Well, first of all, let's look at, there's a, there's a definite kind of prejudice involved. Um, I've used the word ethnocentrism here, but in terms of Budo, there's a belief in Japan that obviously, uh, and there's a lot of pride attached to the fact that Budo is inherently, inherently Japanese. Uh, Budo, <clears throat> and I'm, uh, forgive me, I, I know I'm generalizing here, um, but seeks uh, differentiation from non-Japanese athletic culture or sports, which for some reason is a dirty word in Budo. 
as if sports isn't a culture as well. Um, it is promoted internationally as soft power in the form of traditional Japanese sports. So here we have another contradiction. Um, and uh, it always stresses um, and to, to uh, highlight its uh, distinctiveness, um, the paradox, the paradox, the katsuninken, setsuninto paradox of using techniques of destruction for personal cultivation. So that's, that's uh, a description of budo in a nutshell. That would be how I would explain uh, budo. What about koryu? Well, it's similar, but the way it is interpreted and the way it is uh, organized in Japan, belief that koryu is inherently Japanese, fine. It seeks differentiation from budo, that's Japanese budo, and other non-Japanese martial culture. It's promoted, sort of, as soft power uh, in the form of intangible cultural heritage. Okay, and finally, stresses the paradox of using techniques of destruction for personal cultivation. So that sort of thing sort of is, this, is the same, right? Again, how is Budo and Kobudo divided in Japan? Um, I've got up here, what is Budo, which would translate into also what isn't Kobudo. Um, and this is really uh, what the general consensus is of how Budo evolved into what it is post Meiji um, in order to make uh, the traditional Kobudo something that uh, is accessible to uh, all Japanese people because let's face it it is part of their traditional heritage uh, something that by virtue of being born Japanese you have samurai DNA um, and this is something that's very important to that. So in order to make it uh, accessible to children in the school system, uh, obviously uh, safety was an issue. We can't have kids killing each other. Um, techniques uh, and the facilities and equipment were uh, well developed to ensure that more people would be able to participate. They needed fair criteria for judging, that means shiai uh, rules, and, uh, and even uh, examinations, promotion examinations for dan, q, etc. Um, it had to be, well, I don't know if homogenized is the right word, standardized, um, which required removal of specific duha identifiers, okay, because duha were uh, <laughs> always uh, rather. Um, well, antagonistic, perhaps, traditionally speaking, towards each other. Um, there was no, well, obviously it required no particular official religious affiliation. Um, maybe Kokka Shinto, state Shinto, was a, a kind of a strange uh, uh, exception to that. But uh, open participation it was no longer officially the domain of samurai or rich uh, um, shomin. Uh, everybody. Uh, could and was encouraged to participate. Um, it required a transparent and egalitarian governing body as opposed to the saw care system uh, or other traditional means of um, passing on that knowledge. And also rational teaching methodology for group instruction. So these, this is generally how um, Gendai Budo, the evolution of Gendai Budo is explained uh, in Japan uh, today. So this is general perception in Japan, uh, which eventually makes its way into the big wide world. Um, Budo and Koryu, if we compare them, Budo post Meiji, uh, Koryu pre Meiji. Budo is inclusive, Koryu is exclusive. Uh, Budo is combat roots, Koryu is combat oriented. Um, uh, Budo is competition oriented, uh, Koryu is kata oriented. Rational teaching content versus arcane teaching content. Educationally oriented versus educational potential. Aesthetic, highly aesthetic, quite aesthetic, highly aesthetic. No, uh, some Western influence in Budo, uh, no Western influence in Koryu. Uh, the door jutsu thing. And um, I love this word, thank you Chip, agnostic. Okay, so competition uh, versus kata. Um, so this is uh, 
whether you agree with this or not, this is what I perceive as a sort of like the general uh, understanding of, or, or the divide, if you like, between uh, Budo and Kobudo in Japan. Um, I'm just going to come back to that a little bit later on. Okay, so now I want to go into uh, just briefly look at, uh, well, what I call Budo migration. Uh, is it heresy <laughs> or is it, is it hearsay? Well, we all know uh, that it's not hearsay because everybody's here. Uh, for example, Budo, I often say, is probably Japan's most successful cultural export. Yeah, 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 sushi, I know. Um, anime, yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. But Budo has been around a lot longer, okay? And we all know as well that there are far more Budo practitioners in total outside of Japan than there are in Japan. Uh, if we look at the waves, and again, this is a work in progress, but just generally speaking, it sort of started back, uh, as uh, uh, Liam mentioned before, early days, Meiji period. Uh, you introduced uh, some pe uh, people, uh, Westerners, who came over here, um, like F.J. Norman. Um, but uh, they were sort of an, an exception. There were a lot more Japanese who were going out of Japan and settling in other countries around the world. So Japanese migration, colonialism, um, and particularly after the Russo-Japanese War, this all contributed to um, sporadic but very healthy Budo populations in certain centres around the world. And I've got a <laughs> newspaper. This is 1905. Uh, this is from the Auckland Star newspaper, which uh, they pilfered from a British newspaper because they always used to get the British news and put it in the newspapers in New Zealand. This is one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, articles that I just dug up um, in uh, the Alexander Turnbull Library in New Zealand about martial arts, Japanese martial arts making their way to the West. This is fantastic. I'll read it out to you. The Japanese art of jiu-jitsu, or self-defense, has become the rage in London, and elderly ladies attired in physical culture dress wrestle with each other instead of going to the countless massage establishments. I'm not quite sure what that means, but anyway. <laughs> Spinsters living in lonely suburbs are learning the art so that they can tackle hooligans in cases of necessity, where small sky terriers afford little protection. Young men and old men have put themselves in the hands of Japanese professors, and the result of the boom has been an influx of little yellow men into London, <laughs> many of whom are very indifferent teachers. Nothing changes there. Now, there are now over 40 schools of jiu-jitsu in London, and this is 1905 we're talking about. Over 40 schools of jiu-jitsu in London, and the physical culture people and those who run gymnasiums are doing all they can to pour cold water on the Japanese fad as being extremely dangerous and joint dislocating. <laughs> so there's it, it's, so much of this stuff out there, it's, it's remarkable, but it was quite a phenomenon. Um, so we can see that, you know, from an early stage, for various reasons, Budo, well, it wasn't called Budo back then at all, but uh, the martial arts uh, were making a real uh, impact. Um, what else have I got there? Ah, yes. Wartime. If I can go back. Uh, okay, wartime. Uh, this is the sort of focus on... Uh, the martial arts in the West, well, it moved to, as it did in Japan, very combat-oriented. And this is, this is actually really fascinating. This uh, is, I got this from the, uh, from Bath University. Um, they have the Bowen collection there. And this was a magazine. I, th I think the magazine's name was Illustrated. 1944. Okay. And there's a special... Uh, section in there about how the RAF, okay, that's the Royal Air Force, um, was uh, really getting into their judo, right? Now, <laughs> Japan was at war with Britain. They were, they were enemies. And here we have it, 1944, a uh, group of people in a dojo, dressed in Japanese attire, doing the old Japanese regi thing, Okay, and participating in judo, which is sort of, uh, and by the way, the, uh, the instructor is Sergeant Chu, 
Okay, I don't know if anybody knows him, but um, I, I just thought this is, this is quite a, an incredible um, situation, really, isn't it? When you, when you think about the hostility and the, well, the hatred that existed between um, Japan and, and, and other allied uh, countries at the time. But such was, again, the, the, the allure of Japanese martial arts. Um, get to the 1950s, you find, uh, well, when GHQ um, set up, or the Occupation Force set up base here in, in Japan, this was another time that sort of uh, introduced Budo to a completely new group of people. And we see articles like, this isn't from the Far East News, Americans shown deadly power of karate, hand combat taught in Okinawa and still. So we'd get teachers going out to the, the bases and, and uh, teaching. Um, well, in particular, karate and, and judo. Um, I found this the other day too. Um, Don Draeger, right? A Marine judo expert coaches aspirants uh, with 1st Marine Division. Now this, um, the date, I think was 1953. Um, I think, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, um, if anybody has any idea, but a school of Japanese judo is currently operating behind the front lines of the 1st Marine Division in Korea. Taught by Marine Captain Don F. Drager, Milwaukee, uh, current Japanese intercollegiate champion and fourth degree black belt holder, the school has attracted wide interest am among the leathernecks. I don't know what a leatherneck is. I sort of thought turtles were called leathernecks, but um, in any case, Captain Drager, who is vice chairman of the U.S. National AAU Judo Committee, hauled 15 Japanese tatami mats over to Korea for his students, and they form a practice ring for judo aspirants on the headquarters battalion stage. So there was a photo there somewhere, obviously. So. Um, we start looking, uh, going further down into the 1970s, um, popular culture. Uh, movies uh, and books, which I'll talk about very shortly, uh, again sort of inspired another boom or were inspired perhaps by, um, in particular Karate Shorinji Kenpo, Ninjutsu of course, uh, uh, something that's virtually unheard of in Japan, funnily enough, uh, became, started to become very popular overseas and uh, uh, just around about this time or a little bit before, this is another photo. Has anybody seen this photo before? Has anybody seen it? You have, right? Nobody else? How about, um, you haven't? This is actually, uh, I got this from the All Japan Kendo Federation archives and they didn't even know they had it. Um, but it's actually Don Drager um, put, um, demonstrating Jodo uh, in 1964 at the Nippon Budokan um, to commemorate uh, obviously the holding of the Olympics in Tokyo. Uh, and also the first time that judo was to um, uh, become an, an official event, they had a series of other budo demonstrations, and uh, Don Drago was one of the demonstrators. So I think this is quite a rare, rare photograph. Um, again, into the 1980s, we start talking about well the Eastern boom, you know, Zen, uh, and this Eastern holism type thing, Aikido, Kudo became particularly popular. Um, oop, sorry, I'll, I'll jump past that, where are we? Okay, and a little bit later on, uh, the bubble, okay, which is about the time when I came to Japan, uh, or a little bit towards the end of it. And so from the bubble, of course, we see this massive uh, in uh, interest in things Japanese and uh, what makes Japanese business tick. How did they become the economic animals that they are? Wow, that must be samurai strategy. That's what it is. And so there was a, a, a whole lot of interest that was um, directed at understanding uh, Japanese martial culture, martial history from a completely different perspective, a management or an economic perspective. And you start seeing uh, Books like Miyamoto Masashi's Gorin no Sho being uh, translated and uh, to this day uh, these books um, and other books like Budo Shoshinshu and uh, Hagakure 
and wait for it, wait for it, uh, and so forth. These, these books, not martial arts per se, but sort of like seen as being the, the philosophical extension of the martial arts. And by virtue of that, not only by reading and understanding the samurai history and culture, but people also started participating more enthusiasm in the arts themselves, you're welcome. Okay. Yeah. If you're interested. We're not, we're not supposed to market things here, right? So anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. Up to, up to the uh, present day, the 2000s terrorism, I think, uh, sort of sparked another kind of boom. And it's, it's, just, it's just, it comes in ebbs and flows, uh, these waves of dissemination. And it's an ongoing thing. And what's interesting here is like, um, the motivation, the reasons why people are doing uh, Budo change uh, outside of Japan changes depending on the period. I came here, I started as, uh, as I said in the, in the mid to yeah, mid 80s, I guess you could say mid to the late 80s. Um, when I teach uh, international students at university and they're interested in martial arts, it's not uh, to do with the samurai culture or the mindset or the uh, the economic sort of application that it was when I started, it was completely, it's completely about anime, all right? And it's, it's you know, it's, everything's, everything is, is, is always changing. Um, the Nippon Budokan uh, has been very uh, active uh, in promoting uh, Japanese martial culture. Uh, as a form of, I guess you could say, soft, soft power, which I mentioned before, around the world. Uh, to date, we've had 30, actually, I tell a lie, 31 international Budo seminars. The first one, who was there at the first one? Yeah, right? That's right. You guys caused so much trouble. <laughs> you did. You did. Um, I was there. I was there. I saw it. I didn't understand any of it, but I saw it. And just to to <laughs> reminisce, I'm sure you will remember. It was it was very tense. The international Budo seminar, um, in when it first uh, when they first had had it in 1989, uh, the whole idea was to invite uh, Budo practitioners, non-Japanese Budo practitioners. Uh, to hear lectures on uh, various aspects of Budo culture, the history, the philosophy, um, and also participate uh, in what they call Taiken Budo, where you might be a Kendo practitioner, but you've always wanted to try Kyudo, or you've always wanted to try Shorinji Kempo or something. So you get this opportunity to train and practice, uh, to try them out. And it's really, really a lot of fun. It was really cool, and it lasted for 30 years. Um, the very first one was interesting because we had experts in the field. The Budokan took the approach that, well, you know, we're going to teach these foreigners about Budok because they really don't understand it. And we're going to help them understand it. And uh, so you get these uh, cynical hoplologists rocking up, <laughs> asking very difficult questions. And... To be honest, I, th I think uh, the professors were completely and totally up for anything. The problem was with the interpreting, I believe, and a lot of stuff was, uh, well, it went off on the wrong, you know, the points were missed. And because the points were missed, the people asking the questions were getting a little bit frustrated, although they were too polite to ask in Japanese themselves because we had interpreters there, you know, and that would mean that they would lose face, right? Um, and so the questions were getting completely different answers and the tension built and it built over the, the couple of days that were there. And right at the end, everybody was, all the senseis were, uh, the lecturers and, and so forth, they're all up the front and they had this session. Uh, if you want to ask any questions about Budo, now's your time. And it was a kind of a nervous sort of nervous tension in, in the air. Again, I, I, I didn't know anything about what was going on. I was just sitting there going, wow, what's going on here? And, and <laughs> a 
Right, a guy called Greg, really cool dude. Um, I, I wonder what happened to him. Uh, he was a ninja, right? He practiced ninjutsu and he walked up to the mic and he had his hat on and he had his hands in his pockets and he was about to ask one of the senseis a question. And then suddenly, one of the Budokan staff came up and said, Bang it up! And then all hell broke loose because he was offended. He'd been, you know, he'd seen the tension and, and he thought that, you know, we were showing great disrespect to the people. When you get this guy with dress like this coming up and asking questions, it's like, well, this is ju just too much for him. And he went nuts. He went absolutely nuts. And it's like, whoa, man, you could cut the air with a shin eye. I tell you, it was pretty, it was pretty hardcore. It was like, really, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do anyway? Interestingly, the last Buddha seminar was held last year. They suddenly scrapped it. For another one and they had the first international budo seminar for exchange students and embassy staff in march so that means that everybody there uh for, for the most part were uh, inexperienced in, in martial arts right <laughs> and this is actually a photo <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is Femi, okay, Femi's from Nigeria, and he is a total dude, man, he is really, really cool. But here you have it, okay, uh, from Nigeria, with his sunglasses, his military cap, and his knuckle duster gloves on, asking a question, uh, this is actually, actually asking a question, and the Buddha kind of stuff, none of them blinked an eye, <laughs> at all, and I, I just remembered... <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Greg, 30 years ago, they almost started World War III. And anyway, Femi comes up here and does the same thing. And it, it's, what my point here is, wow, the Japanese have come a long way here. In fact, afterwards, yeah, Femi san Anyway, so the Wudo Khan has been, uh, oh, I'm going to run out of time. I really have to put this in. Um, Anybody know this guy? Randy Channel. Yeah. He completely helped us all out because after this went down and, and uh, the Biddle Khan staff went crazy, he put his hand up and he said, Sensei, I've got a question that's been bugging me for years and years and I, I just hope that one of the esteemed Sensei's professors can answer it for me. I think this is really important uh, to Buddha and it can really help us understand a lot. And everyone's going, oh God, what's Randy going to do now? What's he going to do? And he goes, <clears throat> can you please tell me how Bruce Lee died? <laughs> <laughs> this is Randy now. He's a tea master for Urasenke in Kyoto. Yeah. So anyway, so books and videos are another thing. Uh, like I was involved with this book, Karate My Life. Uh, which is the autobiography of uh, Kanazawa Hirokazu. I put that in English. Uh, the books, uh, actually I'm involved in pretty much all of these. Uh, Budo, The Martial Ways of Japan. Um, Sakai Sensei's Ideology of the Sword, um, which I uh, did the editorial supervision. And of course, um, Otaki Risuke Sensei's um, book, which was translated by Daniel Lee. So the Budo Kan really is uh, doing a lot to, to try and uh, get the word out there if you like and they have Buddha delegations that they send all around the world every year. Uh, I was involved with the uh, trip to Australia. Uh, for one delegation they take about 70 people. Nagao Sensei was also on one of them a few years ago. Uh, the budget that they spend on this to go overseas, uh, do a demonstration for a public demonstration and also usually go to a Japanese school in the area to, to mingle with the children. It would take 70 people, usually, from the nine modern budo and three koryu. Uh, when I went to Australia, uh, the bill for that, for that one trip, was uh, nanasen mayen. So that's close on a million dollars, right? Uh, New Zealand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of money goes into this. 
uh, the Budo Khan itself, you know, they're host to international competitions and so on and so forth. Actually, this is a photo uh, from the first Budo seminar. That's me about to get squashed uh, by Randy Channel, believe it or not. <laughs> um, another thing that I should just, uh, you all know, I believe, uh, the, the Budo Charter. Well, that first came out in, I think it was in the late 1980s, and the original Japanese translation, uh, sorry, English translation of that was, was somewhat uh, skewed, I think, um, where, like uh, the underlying section of here, however, infatuation with mere technical training and undue concern with winning is a severe threat to the essence of Budo. And the, inf the inference was that since it's become popular internationally, it's starting to go downhill. So we've got to go back and work out what the spirit of Budo is, and we've got, to we've got to preserve this natural heritage, this national, sorry, national heritage of Japan. Um, I, along with a, uh, a fellow uh, called John Rogers, who I think is an absolutely magnificent scholar who unfortunately died a few years ago, uh, were tasked with retranslating this into something a little bit more uh, Gaijin user friendly, and we sort of changed a few things around. It's just uh, you know, finding nuances. Um, like some of the changes that we made were <laughs> to try and sort of move it away from that since it's become internationally popular, things are going downhill. Uh, or uh, let's not worry about national culture, let's just preserve this traditional culture because, as all of you guys here, I'm sure. Uh, myself included, I, I've dedicated myself to the study of Budo, not because I particularly want to become a Japanese person. I just do it because I love it and it helps me as a person. So to take away that kind of, uh, again, I've got to be careful here, but that kind of cultural imperialism, so <laughs> we sort of, um, we made it a little bit more, uh, well, less provocative perhaps. Um, but you know, again, I don't want to criticise, and this, this is Article 6 from the, uh, from the Budor Charter. Uh, one, the sixth article is about, well, it clearly maintains that promoting Budor, people who promote Budor must maintain an open mind, international perspective. And this is actually really profound, but it's not really what's happening. It's exactly what Don Draeger uh, did for us, but he is largely unknown in Japan. He's largely unknown, and his contributions are largely unknown. If anybody, uh, he is the man who really, sp not only for Japanese Budo, but his, his approach was to, to look at all of the different martial cultures around the world and compare them and see if we can find some common threads here, which helps us understand everything, humanity, uh, in, in many more different ways, rather than the inward thinking that kind of represents uh, the Japanese Budo uh, today. Um, I'm gonna, I've got 10 minutes left, and I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to jump ahead. Just um, while I'm talking about this international spread of Budo, um, as I said before, I think that Budo is, uh, is Japan's greatest cultural export. And one, another thing that surprises me is the surprise that many of my Japanese colleagues and friends uh, display when they realise how incredibly far-reaching Budo has become. And the various reasons that they do it. Uh, I've got a whole list of stuff here why people start Budo outside of Japan. And in Japan as well, it's the same sort of thing. But Obviously, I can't talk about all of them, but there's one in particular, one area in particular uh, that interests me um, because my first um, uh, research field was actually um, religious studies. And religion is something that, religion and Budo as a religion, in a way, is, is, a, is an idea or, or something that, that fascinates me. And um, I'm just going to jump across that. I just want, I'm going to introduce just a very short episode or experience I had uh, living in Iran. Um, when I say I lived in Iran, I was only there for about six months. Uh, and that was in 2004. And the reason I went over there was to, uh, obviously, a very um, 
uh, devout Islamic country, uh, I wanted to see the extent that Japanese martial arts, the influence that they have in, in, in Iranian culture. To my surprise, when I went over there, uh, I discovered that um, the number one uh, physical activity in Iran is soccer. Okay, well that's no surprise. But number two, collectively, are the martial arts. And I thought that was really, really interesting. I just like, for example, this. Uh, I was mainly in with the with the kendo people, um, but this is uh, an Iranian nihonto, handmade, because you can't just go down to the shop and buy one, obviously. Uh, handmade, and in fact that blade, it looks like your typical iaito. Um, well, it's not. It was actually the, sus uh, the spring suspension from a car that was hammered out. <laughs> very sharp, very dangerous. I don't trust those makugis at all. But this is um, what, you know, my... my uh, friends over there were practicing Eido with. Um, I did a little bit of sightseeing while I was there as well and I went and saw uh, these Zoroastrian um, ruins. Uh, Zoroastria, uh, the religion, was uh, preceded Islam in Iran. And so these are not taken care of. This is actually a burial mound. Uh, traditionally when people die they would take the bodies and place it on top and uh, and return it to, to nature, sort of very Shinto sort of outlook in a way. But you notice here there's some graffiti. Okay, there's a graffiti and uh, I thought, what, what the hell is that? I go up there, I go inside the thing and I found more graffiti. Do you know what this is? Hey? Kyokushin, yeah. And I can't read this but my friend tells me, yeah, Kyokushin is the strongest karate is what it says apparently. Okay. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This photo is bizarre. Uh, I didn't know until afterwards. Um, but when I, uh, my friend was showing me around, he said, oh, well, okay, today we'll go and s we'll check out some Aikido. Oh, cool, cool. We go to this place and there's a whole lot of guys standing outside with big machine guns. And he said, just shut up. Don't say a word. We don't want people to real and know that you're a foreigner. So I just, just sort of walked in and um, walked through a few corridors. We found this place. Okay, and you can't see it here. I really kicked myself for not taking a photograph, but there were photographs of Ayatora Homeni. Okay, next to him was Kanojigoro, Funakoshi Gichin, and Ueshiba Morihe. All lined up together. <laughs> and it's like, wow, this is amazing. Anyway, I watched the, the Aikido practice, and then I leave, and, and my friend said to me, do you know where we've just been? I said, no, because this was the American embassy. This is the American Embassy, okay? So you all know, of course, what happened in 1979 on Jimmy Carter's watch. Uh, the Tehran University students stormed the embassy, and since then, America has hardly had any uh, diplomatic relations with, uh, with uh, Iran. But fortunately, um, the old building has been put to much more uh, uh, better use, I think. It's a dojo now, or part of it is. The other part of it is a museum that uh, extols the evil influence of Western imperialism, so that's another thing. Um, but um, talking to the Iranian people, I was, <laughs> in retrospect, I was, geez, I'm surprised they let me do this, but I meant it was allowed to take uh, a questionnaire of about 500 people about why they do martial arts. and and. It was, it was quite remarkable. I, my take on this was, well, okay, so Budo has a very strong moral element. And how does, does it have any, how does it fit with the Islamic world outlook? And the reason I chose this example is because of the tragedy that happened in my hometown in Christchurch last week. So it's to pay um, respect uh, to our um, uh, Islamic friends as well. Um, there were many, many different sort of uh, areas I could have introduced, but what, what was fascinating for me was, um, I can't read this of course, but I had somebody read it for me and go through it all, and really the, over, the overall sort of uh, consensus is that practicing Budo, or whatever that is, be it Karate, be it Judo, be it uh, Kobudo, um, to them serves as a supplement for their religion. It's not in contest with it, it's not better, it's not worse. By doing Budo, um, you become a stronger person in mind and body and therefore a better Muslim. And I thought, well, this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, something that was you know, born in Japan can, 
can go pretty much anywhere in the world, uh, anywhere in the world and be adapted and adopted uh, to something that can be useful or seen as being, perceived as being useful in the civil martial arts sense uh, to the, uh, the social norms of that particular um, society or culture. Um, I'm going to finish off now. I've got five minutes and uh, I just want to uh, go back to Draga Sensei. You see, uh, for Gendai Budo at least, um, all, pretty much every of the nine uh, Gendai Budo have international federations. Ju Kendo is a work in progress, but just uh, um, we will we'll have something organized very soon, I think. But if you look at the years uh, where these international federations were formed, uh, this coincides with the other print that I've given you. Um, this is actually Tony Kundi uh, sort of plotted this, so I appreciate uh, what he's done here. It sort of puts things in perspective. Um, you can see where, in particular, uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, where Budo sort of became quite an international phenomenon. Um, Draeger's works were instrumental. His work was instrumental and fundamental in helping create the momentum and the, philo uh, the philosophical understanding of Budo culture, which allowed Japan to achieve wide-scale international dissemination. I think you could say, you could say, and I'm sure he would be horrified. He would be horrified if I sort of, uh, or if he, if anybody suggested suggested this to him when he was alive. But his books, in a way, for for Westerners in particular, the Book of Genesis, uh, or in, in the pro uh, proselytism of, of Japanese Buddha. We didn't have anything like that, and. The Japanese powers that be that were trying to promote the Budo, there's always, as there was in the first Budo seminar that we went to, there's always that linguistic barrier and that, that, uh, that in incredible difficulty in trying to express or convey um, a context. Um, but Draga did all that for us. I think it's because of his work that Budo was able to become the international phenomenon that it is today. Uh, is it here to stay? I'm going to jump ahead because I've got three minutes. I um, just want to address one more thing, and I think this is really important. And uh, Liam uh, said uh, Don Drager was deeply concerned whether the Koryu would survive, and if so, in what form. Uh, to ensure their survival, he wanted to spread serious non-Japanese among the Koryu. Um, and Chip said very early on, Don Drager told me that these old traditions were and are vibrant living entities. Not only are they worth preserving, saving, uh, but they have significant vital lessons that are applicable to the fighting man of today's world. This is exactly what uh, um, Chip introduced to us before. Now, unfortunately, because of this dichotomy that has arisen, uh, Kobudo versus Budo, I think that both Kobudo, Koryu, if you like, and Gendai Budo have some serious fundamental problems. I would give them a D, okay, at the moment. Um, problems with Koryu, dwindling numbers. Dreadful, dreadful technical level overall. If you go and see demonstrations, it's like, oh my god, are you serious? Okay. Uh, disjointed historical understanding. Deficient comprehension of context. Depressing political wrangling. Discrimination abounds. Dearth of reliable information, disabled by dubious tradition or traditions, and doesn't respect modern Buddha. It's missing ji, jirichi no ji. But what about Buddha? Buddha, okay. Dwindling numbers, in Japan at least, deteriorating technical level, disjointed historical understanding, hello. Deficient comprehension of context, depressing political wrangling, discrimination abounds, dearth of reliable information, uh, disingenuous to tradition, and doesn't respect Koryu. Okay. Speaking from a Kendo perspective, but I think other Budo are probably similar, what do we think of the Koryu as Gendai Budo practitioners? Koryu is boring, it's too esoteric. It's full of weirdos and wannabe samurai. <laughs> Koryu doesn't have any point. It's traditional dancing. Koryu will give me bad habits. 
Koryu won't help me win competitions or pass grades. Koryu will keep me away from already limited keiko time. Koryu smells of pomposity. Okay. Well, what about Koryu's objectionable subjective objections? Kendo is not the real thing. Kendo is merely a sport. Kendo is full of meatheads. Kendo pisses on tradition. Kendo is egocentric. Kendo is violent. Kendo will keep me away from already limited careful time. And Kendo just smells. Okay. Am I wrong? Okay. There's prejudices out there, guys, right? Now, as somebody who now sort of feels comfortable in being able to say this, you know, I've been doing it for 30 years now. According to Miyamoto Masashi, 30 years, I should be, I should be about to be enlightened into something. I'm not quite sure what that is, but anyway. The Gendai Budo that I do, Kendo Yairo Nagi Nata Ju Kendo Tanken. The Koryu that I uh, practice, uh, Jikshin Kageryu, Tendo Ryu, Hokiryu, Katayama Ryu. Now, uh, everybody's different, that's why I've highlighted me, but to me, what I get out of doing Budo is grunt. The fight, the randomness, okay, the excitement, the thrill, the desperation, the emotion, the interaction. It gives me the grunt. I look at that as ji, jirichi no ji. Practicing koryu, well that gives me gravitas. It gives me an understanding of the, the theories, you know, what it is to hold a sword, how to use a sword, distance, timing, etc, etc. Uh, koryu is kata-centric, of course, the ones I do at least. Um, but always, the way I look at it now is looking for sort of like the chaos in the order. Whereas Budo is competition-centric, at least the Budo that I do. And what I find myself doing is looking for order in the chaos. And these things really complement each other a hell of a lot. Why the hell are we treating them as different things? You know, I, I, I believe, and I stand to be corrected, but I believe that's what Don Draga Sensei also thought as well. If, uh, and if we look at his categorizations, I think that becomes abundantly clear. Um, so, in conclusion, and I'm one minute over, I apologize, uh, Don Draga provided a succinct categorization that is largely unknown or ignored in Japan. That's going to change from now, thank you to, uh, to Nagao Sensei and, and other uh, scholars. Um, Kobudo versus Budo dichotomy is ambiguous conceptual understanding. See the lump in the carpet over there because it's all been swept under. All right. Um, more meaningful international interaction is needed. I think cultural friction is a really good thing. It really helps us put things in perspective. And again, it's because of that what Nagao Sensei organized yesterday, I think, is going to really be quite stimulating for Japanese scholars from now on instead of the usual cultural imperialism thing. Well, what about Nihonji? We know more about this than you guys because this is our culture, after all. Um, it's not the case anymore. And if, if anything, if you're going to do that, then you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, I think people are starting to realise that. More contextual uh, understanding is needed. Uh, in other words, to challenge the status quo and revisit the kind of things that Drager... Uh, um, introduced to us. I really believe there's some incredible answers in there. More budo and koryu interaction needed and more than anything else more beer to discuss all of this is also needed. So on that note I'm, I believe we're going to have uh, some very vibrant discussions from now on. I'd like to thank you all and I'd like to thank Don Drager uh, even though he's not here with us I, I guess I, well um, I hope that he's here with us in spirit. I know he is inside me anyway. So thank you for your attention everybody. I'd like to point out immediately that uh, uh, although comments were made that Alex is not sponsored by Nike, uh, <laughs> he is willing to have the conversation uh, about it at the moment. Um, Fantastic talk. Uh, like any good professor, uh, he's timed it so that there's no time for any particular questions. <laughs> you got it. Very, very skillful. Um, <clears throat> having said that, if there's something burning at the moment, uh, Mike with the mic will come round. Are there any questions now? Sir, Mike.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Bennett, for a very informative and very candid uh, presentation. Uh, you mentioned that Budo is Japan's most successful cultural export, uh, and that, that has many factors, some of which having to do with government promotion. Um, what do you think is the most effective thing that the central Japanese government or related bodies can do to continue to promote Budo abroad as we approach the Olympics, uh, with the exception of empowering ambassadors such as Drager or yourself? I don't know. <laughs> what can they do? I mean, <clears throat> um, I mean that, that's kind of a loaded question on many different levels as well, isn't it? But I think, what can, they, what can they do? Well, to give you an example of the sort of thing that I'm involved with personally right now, two things. Uh, whether it's good or bad, I do not know. But um, I, I was uh, asked by Fukushima Prefecture last year um, to help um, try and get some interest in Fukushima uh, because Japan is seeing a tourist boom at the moment um, uh, irrespective of you know the Olympics and so forth coming up but uh, there are more tourists in Japan than ever before but they're avoiding places like Fukushima okay for reasons that we well know um, and so I was asked to help out with uh, what they call well it's become a, quite a well-known word now but samurai tourism and, and what I did was, uh, it was a monitor tour essentially, but um, I got a, a number of interested people to come along and we, I plotted a, a, a kind of a, a course in Fukushima that highlights the history of Fukushima, the, particularly the samurai influence, because last year being 150 years after the Meiji Restoration, never say Meiji Restoration in Fukushima, by the way, because they were on the wrong side. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and tying that history in with actual practice. And uh, the feedback that we got from the people that, that participated was, was remarkable because suddenly it all made sense. It's talking about the context. Okay, so we're able to, uh, through experience and also uh, providing information, uh, able to bring all of this together into something that's easy, easy to understand. So this was something that I think has a lot of potential. Um, the other thing that I'm involved with at the moment, which I don't think has a lot of potential, um, is the Nippon Budokan has asked me to translate a book uh, that uh, is based on a series of articles, 24 articles written over the last two years in the magazine Get Kambudo, and it's about the history of karate. And if you read Get Kambudo, you may have seen these articles. They're written by three uh, karate uh, sensei from different uh, goju ryu, wado ryu, shito ryu, different ryuha, and of course, Never the twain shall meet, but it's time that everybody got together and actually worked out what this is because there's no consensus in karate history in Japan. And so that's why the Budokan put this together and they, uh, they've asked me to translate it uh, so that it can be put out in time for the Olympics. So people who are coming over here, obviously they want to see perhaps the karate competition, will also be able to see, ah, Naruhodo, this is where it all came from, sort of thing. So they're the sort of things that are happening. But apart from that, I really, I really couldn't give you any other suggestions. That's okay, Ben. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for maybe just one more question before we move on. If there's no question, I'm going to ask one. What do we know about what Drager actually did in terms of kendo? See, this, <laughs> this is something that I want to ask um, Chip and, and Liam and, and Phil because uh, I've seen that uh, Drager Sensei has nana done in kendo. I've seen that written somewhere. Um, I actually uh, went searching uh, through the archives at the Zen Nihon Kendo Rembe to see if I can find a date of conferral of this done. Um, I couldn't find anything. And that's not to say that it's not there, it's just there's so much stuff that I wouldn't, wasn't able to give it proper scrutiny. So I've never seen any video of Drago Sensei actually doing Kendo. But if he does have none of done, that's quite a, that's a significant done level. Phil, would you would you like to enlighten us on that? <clears throat> I'm going to take a guess at this. Uh, I agree. The I'm not. I know Don. I knew Don very well, and I never saw him do kendo. However, he has a seventh don in the Kendo Federation Jodo. And it's quite possible ah. that it's been misunderstood. 
So that's my answer. I, I'm not positive, I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty close to it, I think. Because I never saw, in all the time that I trained with him, mm, he never once talked about it. I'll, I'll talk a little later when I get a chance, if that, if that again that comes up, okay? Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Phil. Beautiful. Does that answer your question, Tom? It does. Thank <laughs> okay. you very much. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Dr. Alex. Thank you very much.